worked in the Centre for Climate Change Research at the University of Manchester, and we're based in the School of Mechanical, Aerospace and Civil Engineering. So um, I think we're probably some of the, the non-geographers that would like to kind of engage more with, 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 with geographers, basically. Um, this project is based on, this paper is based on a project called the High Seas Project, which was funded by the EPSRC to look at how um, shipping can make uh, significant and ra radical reductions in, it, in its carbon emissions. Um, and so, just a, basically an overview of the presentation, I'll talk a bit about international shipping before then moving on to talk about the kind of different options that shipping can use going forward to reduce its energy consumption. And then I'll present a, a couple of contrasting scenarios for kind of UK shipping in 2050. So, I mean, shipping is an interesting sector because it, it provides a service to other sectors of the economy. So the demand for shipping is influenced by, by what happens in these other sectors, by the state of the economy, our changing tastes, and also by, by structural changes. 80 to 90 percent of global trade is transported by ship, and the IMO, which is the International Maritime Organization, estimate that international shippings are approximately currently 7 <coughs> percent of, of kind of anthropogenic global CO2 emissions, and they argue that it's the most efficient mode of transport per unit of transport work. It would be fair to say that shipping has escaped lightly from climate policy pressure compared to other sectors, and there, there's many reasons for this. It's a very complex sector. Um, unlike aviation, where a, a plane flies from one airport to another, a ship may cool several times en route from, a, from its kind of departure destination to where cargo is unloaded, cargo is unloaded at different points along the journey. A ship may suddenly change destination because a different buyer has been found for a particular cargo. So there's a, a whole level of uncertainty associated with firstly estimating shipping emissions, but then also uh, in terms of climate policy, apportioning those emissions between nations. Um, these uncertainties have led to shipping, international shipping emissions being excluded from UK climate policy. So although emissions are reported, shipping isn't within UK climate budgets. Um, at the international level, it's regulated through the IMO, and so the IMO argue that shipping shouldn't be under come under national policy regimes. It should be regulated on its own as a as a global sector. The IMO, however, is a, it's an international organisation where policies have to be made um, with the unanimous agreement of all members of the IMO. And so, to date, it's been that. Um, Coalitions of countries with different um, I suppose, views on either the seriousness of climate change or the appropriateness of regulation have led to a very kind of weak regulation of shipping. They have two um, flagship policies, the Energy Efficiency Design Index and the Ship um, Energy Efficiency Management Plan that they kind of put forward as being policies which will kind of curb the climate change impact of shipping. But these curves kind of show this is a the bottom curve is, a, is a, a global climate budget for shipping based on a, on a, a two degree, avoiding the temperature rise above two degrees in the future. And the, the above two curves are the, the kind of the, the IMO's estimation of the, the impact that their policies will have. And you can see that the impact of their policies is, is kind of completely at odds with shipping paying its, making its fair contribution to avoiding uh, two degrees C. So this is a, just a, an overview of a, of a model that we've developed within the project. I'm not going to talk about the model, but just highlight that the darker squares that we're going to talk about, uh, the amount of freight that shipped, the, the, dis the distance that it shipped, and then looking at different um, characteristics of ships' operation improvements and the potential for kind of uh, alternative propulsion and onboard energy generation. So, um, I mean, clearly the energy demand of, of shipping is, is influenced by firstly the quantities of freight that are shipped and the distances that they are shipped. This graph shows uh, where UK oil and oil products have come from, uh, that's in 2006, and you can see that a ship, say for example, uh, securing oil and oil products from the Middle East, say across to America, would 
immediately increase the distance over which they were shipped with a corresponding impact on energy demand. Then we've also got um, the carbon plan and decarbonisation of the energy system as a, an example of a structural change. So currently 50% of UK imports by weight are associated with fossil fuels and so as the energy system decarbonises and the way in which the energy system decarbonises, that, that's likely to have a huge impact on the quantities of fossil fuels shipped, maybe increasing biomass shipped and so the corresponding kind of energy demand in order to, to move those, fuel, those uh, fuels. Now, there's a number of um, operational changes, I guess, that could be useful in the shipping sector. Uh, that picture's a picture of a, a freight container ship recently de delivered to MERS, which is the largest ever container ship in the world. Um, and so ship size has been increasing incrementally and as ships get bigger you can potentially fit more stuff on them and so may require fewer ships. Um, slow steaming is the practice of basically going slower uh, and has been is becoming more common within shipping because of the increased price of, of marine fuel. Um, ship, increasing ship size is a way of facilitating slow steaming because otherwise um, if your ships just went slower but not necessarily got bigger, then you may need more ships in order to ship the same amount of stuff, kind of again having an increase in energy demand. And all these, both these factors, the you know, improved communications and ICT is, is essential. Um, often a ship may travel very fast to get to its destination, but then sit outside a, a dock for four or five days before it can actually berth, kind of unlike aviation. So the kind of the, the penetration of kind of virtual technologies for virtual docking or uh, planned arrival times could be a way of increasing energy demand. Now shipping is, is blessed in many senses with a whole host of, of technology options. Um, firstly for improving the energy efficiency. So that picture is a is a bulbous bag basically. It could be retrofitted to ships and it would improve the streamlining of the ship and reduce friction and so reduce the energy demand needed to move that particular ship through the water and it's, it's very much been the case that to date um, shipyards want to build an off-the-shelf ship basically but a lot could be done in terms of kind of holistic whole ship design and looking at how you could improve reduce the energy demand for a ship by improving the energy efficiency looking at hull shape looking at um, the the, kind of the aerodynamics, the design of superstructures, maybe using composite materials in certain places to reduce the weight and, and so on. And there's a whole host of other technology options. Um, so that's a picture of a, a sky sail, which could be retrofitted onto a ship and use um, basically wind in order to provide additional propulsion. Um, that's a picture of a, a, the B9 concept ship, again, which is a sail hybrid ship kind of kind of going back to those those kind of renewable technologies which realistically used to be the the way that, that goods and, and people move around the world going forward there's also the potential for nuclear ships and the picture at the top is the ss savannah which was a, a nuclear commercial ship um, in the past the economics of, of nuclear shipping have have not added up there's obviously legal safety Perception rig, you know, there's a whole host of issues around um, nuclear shipping, but it is a, a low carbon fuel that kind of could be used on board ships, unlike biofuel, where there's potentially huge competition from other sectors for kind of limited, sustainable supplies of biofuel. So, going on just to talk about uh, two of our scenarios, um, building on the idea that shipping as a, as a sector responds to, to what happens in terms of other sectors of the economy, kind of as economies develop, as trades develop, then shipping has to, has to meet though that demand for trade. So our, our first scenario, um, Big World, assumes a continuization of globalization. So um, transport distances are increased, containerized tra travel is increased. It's using the DEX high CCS scenario to kind of explore the influence of, of that, that kind of energy sector on the energy demand for shipping. Um, the, the where the wind blows scenario is, is, is making the assumption, okay, what if, um, what if for whatever reason globalization does not continue, there might be kind of moves for greater regionalization of demand, currency realignment, 
the alignment. A, a whole host of reasons why countries may say, okay, actually, this isn't working. We want to kind of regionalization is the way forward. That would result potentially in a domination of short, short sea shipping, potentially greater use of modal, modal, multi modal logistics. Um, and, uh, and in this scenario, we're also looking at the influence of so the high debt, high renewable energy scenario to the end of the energy sector. So what do these different scenarios show us in terms of quantities of freight? I'm just going to kind of focus in on sort of a few of these points. So these 2006 and 2010 are kind of just to, to give a comparison with where we are now in the UK. So we can see that in terms of, of quantity of freight, um, our big world scenario has greater containerization, but it's useful looking at, so the, um, say, let's say, take coal as an energy product, there were significant quantities of coal imported in our baseline years, but we can see uh, that, um, that if CCS is not developed in the UK and we don't have coal as an energy source, then the need for shipping that coal kind of decreases significantly. In terms of freight work, which is a, a function of the amount of stuff shipped in the distance over which it travels and in our globalisation scenario kind of a huge increase in the amount of freight work for container ships so reflecting the kind of the greater distance that those goods travel. So moving on to, to talk about um, energy demand so this is the kind of the current primary energy demand for, from shipping um, in, in 2006 and these two bottom the red and the green are basically the remaining probably the primary energy demand of the scenario in, these, in the, those, those two scenarios which have to be satisfied first by fossil fuel and by bioenergy and then the remainder show us the amount of energy which is saved due to the different measures so we can see in this scenario the kind of the huge impact that actually showing slowing ships down and slow steaming has on the energy demand within that particular scenario just a because obviously we're interested in carbon emissions um, so both these scenarios show a significant decrease in carbon emissions which is kind of commensurate with shipping playing actually playing its, its, sort of its appropriate role um, in meeting climate change targets so just to, just to kind of wrap up um, for the shipping sector, there are, I think we've shown that there are numerous pathways to decarbonisation, but there isn't a, it's not a one problem, one solution. There's lots of different ship types, lots of different types of shipping market kind of thing. It's, it's inherently a very complex solution, but there's no single solution to kind of reducing energy demand and carbon emissions from the, the shipping sector. So context is, is key, and, and we can see from our scenarios that the impact just on, on how the UK energy system decarbonises has a, has a knock-on effect on the shipping sector in terms of how it, how it can meet climate change objectives. And I think that's, that's the key to the shipping sector, that it has to respond to what happens in other sectors, and it needs to be resilient. Um, and in many cases, it hasn't been resilient to date. So at the moment, there's huge overcapacity, there's oversupply of ships because the sector assumed that globalization would continue to expect the recession and, and drop in demand. And, and it's how can, looking at how it can address issues of climate change and energy demand and building that resilience. I think the scales of reduction necessary cannot be overstated, but um, significant coordination and, and cooperation that's not been there today within the shipping sector will be required. So thank you very much. Line there. We've got time for a couple of questions whilst the particularly whilst the next presentation is set up. So I'll open the floor. Yes, thank you. Hi, I'm Of 
percentage savings depend sort of in the literature range from about 10% up to 30%, but because it's quite a I guess the, the key is, you know, lots of different ship types, lots of different weather conditions that they sail in, kind of the different impact of, of how often holes are cleaned and so on, other operational practices, so it's actually quite hard to, there isn't a single figure, there's a range of figures, which, which is quite a, quite a big range. Yeah, thank you. Uh, first of all, I wondered a bit about the uh, relatively high share of uh, biofuels that you have assumed, because, uh, well, biofuels, uh, is something that many uh, people are looking at uh, to, to create some improvement in their uh, GHG emissions. But uh, it's, it's perfectly unclear where all these biofuels uh, may come from, in particular taking into account that uh, we are approaching a world with an unbuilding population which uh, require foodstuffs, uh, natural fibers for cloning and so on. So we don't have that much arable land that would be needed to create all those biofuels. No, I mean, I, I mean that's a, a key. Uh, I mean, a key consideration, of, and as well, you, I mean, that's a really good point. And you also have the kind of competing demands for bioresources.